Welcome to the IRS collection process. What you need to know to advise your clients. Co-sponsored by the ABA Business Law Section, Criminal Justice Section, Government and Public Sector Lawyers Division, Section of Taxation, and the ABA Center for Professional Development. Speaking and doing introductions on the program today is William Bob Pope, Jr., Bob is the is with White and Reeser PLC located in Nashville, Tennessee. Bob, please proceed with today's program. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, before I start in introducing the panelists, I want to give you an overview from 30,000 feet of what we're trying to accomplish. The Internal Revenue Service has got very specific things that you need to do to resolve a liability. Most of the people on this call will be a lawyer. All of the panelists are. We've worked together in the past, and we've done panels very much similar to this. We want to introduce you to the part of where you get some practical notions of how to deal with the types of opportunities that the Internal Revenue Service provides. To start off, we're going to have Sarah Neal and Kristen Bucci. Sarah is from St. Louis. Kristen is from Florida. And they were going to talk a little bit about the installment agreements, and the offer and compromise program and the things that can go right and wrong, and how do you develop a record that you can use in a non-CDP or a CDP hearing. Now, before they start, my good buddy Francis Sheehy, also from Florida, is going to take a look at what the Internal Revenue Service Taxpayer Advocate has said about their own collection process for the last couple years. The Advocate does a good job of de defining systemic problems. And that's what Fran will be talking about in terms of trying to find out those things that we can focus on. When Sarah and Christian have finished, Dennis Brager from Los Angeles is going to talk to us about AJAC. This is the appeals program where they're trying to go back to their old I am the court routine and avoid any type of factual development and new issue development. And it's been going on for about a year. That's a fairly important thing. And Dennis has looked at some recent missives from the IRS as to how that will be working. When Dennis finishes up, I'm going to give you an overview of how you can get rid of taxes in a bankruptcy proceeding uh, and some of the upsides and downsides of how that works. It, it's a stark contrast to what the service has. When I get over that, France will try, if we have time left, to go over the late filed return and the governments, both state and federal, quandary about what to do with folks and how the bankruptcy court deals with it. That's what we're going to do. And what I want you to do during the course of this, ask your questions in that chat room as we go along. And saving them up all for the last 15 minutes to me is counterproductive because we need to know what your question is as we move along, and then we can address it when we have that topic. Because we've worked with each other before and we are used to this format, the panelists will feel free and will ask questions of each other as we go through this. That helps you get the benefit of some clarification, some nuances. Uh, this is not meant to be the advanced skill set. It's not meant to be the basics. We're going to go in the middle and try and cover as many things as we think are traps going through the collection process. So with that, Fran, tell us about the Taxpayer Advocates come. Okay, I'm going to pick, pick up where I left off in December and give you um, just a brief overview of the Taxpayer Advocates 2013 annual report and then jump into her objectives for the year 2015. So um, even though there are a whole bunch of things in this report, I just focus on the collection issues. Out of the 25 most serious problems that she came up with for 2013, five of them were collection issues. Uh, the first one was uh, hardship levies, and that is where she is concerned because the IRS uses the automatic levy system on Social Security, even though taxpayers are earning less than 250% of the poverty level and are presumed to be have economic hardship. Uh, then the IRS fails to release them. So she is working on that and... Before I jump into the next ones, the reason I find the Taxpayer Advocates Report to be so useful is if in one of her summaries she is looking in depth at something that 
I happen to be dealing with, I can go to her piece of the report, and at times I use it to argue before the IRS and say, look, this is what's supposed to be happening here. So that's why it's not, this isn't just a, you know, news report. It's really helps as far as when you're looking at cases. The next thing she looked at was the fact that ACS isn't selective in how they choose cases and have to transfer three times as many as they work on to some other segment of the IRS, and she would like them to be a little bit more focused. Uh, the third thing, again, is an ACS thing, that she feels sometimes they just cause delay uh, rather than getting things resolved, and if the cases would be shot out to employees in the field, those employees could contact the taxpayers use IAs and and other things to resolve things for personal and business taxpayers that aren't in compliance. The next thing that I find really interesting, because I have several cases on this, is back in the old days, the IRS used to extend the statute beyond the five years, and then um, in 1991, the IRS policy was that they would not extend a coal sub below, uh, beyond the five years. Unfortunately, the IRS hasn't corrected all those mistakes, and she kind of gave them till June 15th of this year to get all of the affected taxpayers abated who extended their statutes by 20 years and 30 years. So, uh, Fran, this is Dennis. Uh, so you're saying that there are still cases out there where uh, the IRS is attempting to collect, you know, 12, 13, 14, 20 years out? Because to be honest, I haven't, I haven't seen those in my practice. Uh, yep. See, I guess I guess you don't have career clients like me. <laughs> we try and get it done once. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. the The next area of concern to her was CDP hearings, and she felt that taxpayers don't get a chance to resolve their cases prior to going to CDP, and that appeals doesn't exactly understand the purpose of CDP. She has independence concerns, which Dennis is going to talk about in a little bit. And finally, the IRM doesn't provide appeals with guidance for CDP. Rather, they rely on the collections portion. Um, her suggestion, which has come from this group as well for a long time, is resolve the tax liability before you send out the CDP notice. If it's resolved, then you know give that taxpayer the rights they deserve and don't make them waive them and update the um, IRM for appeals. The most litigated issues are pretty much the same every year. CDP, frivolous penalties, enforcing federal tax liens, and innocent spouse. Uh, she, she provides the cases for each of these most litigated items. So if you have an innocent spouse case, which we're not going to talk about today, look in the Tax Bar Advocates report because she will show you every single innocent spouse case that was litigated last year. And then for the objectives for next year, um, she wants the IRS to improve the way they collect taxes by instead of focusing on how old a tax is, try and use IAs and offers in compromise to collect the most collectible, use personal contact and interventions. Uh, this one is near and dear to my heart, to create a task force to look at the 130-plus penalties that the IRS has come up with and see which ones are really necessary. Um, review the policies on how you uh, use penalties. And her most crowning accomplishment from the last two years is she did get the IRS to implement a Taxpayer Bill of Rights. I've attached it to my materials. One of her goals for the next year is to um, help them implement that Taxpayer Bill of Rights and put it into their operations. Um, God bless her if she accomplishes that. Okay, so in short, the One good question news for on the Bill of Rights. I'm sorry? There's no judicial review of any potential violation of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. They can't go to the tax court, district court, or anywhere else, right? There's no hammer. It's just like saying I read it in the, in the manual. So, you know, the, the teeth that they've got on the Bill of Rights is like rubbing your gums together. Kind of like. We'll see. Okay. Okay. So the good news for 2014 is, in 2013, in the 2014 report, there were 47% fewer levies than in 2012, but they still collected more money. Um, 
There were 31% fewer suits to reduce the liens to judgment and the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. The bad news is the IRS is still levying Social Security and not releasing it when there's hardship. ACS isn't isn't resolving a very good percentage of their cases. The Colstead cases aren't being um, abated. And uh, appeals isn't isn't doing what they should with CDP cases. So that's kind of the end of what I have to say right now. Thank you, Fran. With that, Sarah, Kristen, however you guys want to proceed, tell us about the offers and installment agreement. There are a couple questions. Um, well, go ahead and address the questions if you can, Fran. Can you read them? Okay, yes. Uh, someone said, my client has a CP504. Can we file a CDP? The answer is no. You have to wait for the final notice of intent to levy right to notice the final hearing, which is an L1058. How, after, how long after does that take? I don't know. Usually around 30 days. It can It can also depend. Uh, you know, if the case gets transferred if, to a revenue officer, then it's up to the revenue officer to issue the CDP notice. Um, and, you know, as you suggested, Fran, one of the goals is that uh, revenue officers should first try and work a case before actually issuing the CDP notice instead of using it as uh, a way to say hello. Hey, the good news is I have a couple ROs down here in South Florida who are actually doing that. That's good. That's good. Uh, the, the other part of that question is, you know, when can they levy? The fact is that they cannot levy until after the 30 days expires from the final notice of intent to levy right to notice the final hearing notice, as long as you don't file anything. If you file something, then they still can't levy until the whole CDP process is over. So now that I've stolen part of Kristen and Sarah's deal, I'll shut up. Actually, Fran, that was the perfect segue, because I can now move into the collection due process hearings unless Sarah wants to jump in with the installments or the offer and compromise. Krista? Okay, collection due process hearings. These procedures were created in 1998 by the uh, Restructuring and Reform Act, and the purpose of the hearing is to give taxpayers the opportunity for a meaningful hearing before the IRS, before it issues the first levy or immediately after the first lien. One thing I would I want to mention, and I, we don't really have time for it today, but if the lien hasn't been filed, the Notice of Federal Tax Lien, you can always request a CAP hearing, and you can do that with a Form 9423. So that's something you can actually do prior to the lien filing. The collection due process hearings, um, the mission for the appeals, it, appeals office is a little different because the balance is supposed to be fair and impartial both to the government and the taxpayer in Kristen, a way that will enhance. Kristen, Kristen, can I cut in here a second? Yeah, because sure, I, sure. I think the CAP is, is a powerful tool, and I, I just wanted to put some more information into that. If you file, you, you can file a CAP before a lien is issued, and you can ask that the lien not be filed. And you can get to appeals on that issue. Appeals has sole jurisdiction to determine whether or not it's appropriate to file a lien at that point. If you do not get that determination by appeals before a lien is filed, once the lien is filed, collection has sole authority over that lien, and you're never going to get it off. So if it's important to your client, not to have a lien in order for him to do his business and pay his taxes, then filing a cap is essential. And you better do that with the right with the CP504 that this gentleman was talking about. Because if you wait, they file the lien and then send you the notice of lien. So, okay. I'm sorry, Kristen. Go ahead. Okay, Actually, I gotta, this is well, I, let me try and interrupt on that. But Fran, <laughs> going to appeals on, on the cap, Aren't they just generally looking to make sure all the procedural bases have been covered rather than a discretionary whether you should file this or not? No, not in the lien issue. The IRM specifically gives them the sole authority, and they cannot talk to collection. Okay, but I'm saying is it discretion or is it just making sure the I's are dotted and T's are crossed? They, it's they discretion. Can... Wow. 
hadn't been my experience. Well, th- this is Sarah. That's what I was sort of going to ask is we've got a lot of very experienced practitioners on this panel that deal with this stuff. What arguments have you made in the past, either at a CAP hearing or once a lien is, has been filed to, to have it removed um, successfully? I mean, what works? Um, there are the, the, only, um, the only times that I've had any kind of success in preventing a lien from being filed in the first place is when I can specifically uh, document that the filing of the lien will in some way affect the income generating capacity of the individual. So if I've got somebody uh, who's, for example, got a uh, a high security clearance with the government, uh, and I can say, look, if this lien gets filed, there's a good chance uh, that that's going to impact their security clearance, and therefore uh, they might, they could get uh, fired or, or demoted. That's something uh, that you can get somebody's attention with. Uh, if you can show that that you're representing a business that relies on, uh, you know, credit and you can show that there's a provision in the loan agreement which indicates that if a lien is, is, def- is filed, that's a condition of default. That's something, you know, that you can work with. But just the general, well, you know, he's got good credit and he doesn't want to harm his credit. I've never had any luck with those kind of arguments. No, but Dennis, each one of the things that you touch on go back to a general point of there's there's two parts to that when you do a cap is A, you show that the income generating capacity of the taxpayer, whether it's liquidation of assets, whether it's their earning, will be harmed by the filing of the lien. And you also show them in some way that they don't need to worry about assets being stolen, secreted, uh, and, and avoid the impact of their lien. If you can do the two, then they're inclined to listen. And I say inclined to listen advisedly because that's all it is. Uh, There's nothing mandatory that makes them give relief. It's just whether they're inclined to have the conversation. And one other alternative, of course, that's not commonly used but that the service will accept is a bond as collateral. Um, They're expensive, and, you know, many times, when you actually find out what the the bonding company is willing to issue, the taxpayer is not excited about the fee associated with it. But in a circumstance where you don't have another good option, that is available. Yeah. One gentleman uh, asked a question. I assume it's a gentleman named Gordon. Um, if you file a request for a CDP hearing, does that bar the IRS from filing a lien? No. The statute says that they can file a lien and then they give you notice. Uh, if they haven't filed a lien and they give you notice of final notice of intent to levy, that's kind of unusual. Normally they already filed the lien before they issue the final notice of intent to levy. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, and just, yeah. okay. This is Kristen. I was just going to say that's where I, I think that that emphasizes Fran's point of what you can do before the filing with the cap and why the cap can be so helpful. I think the big dis- distinction between the CAP and the CDP hearing is that there will be no judicial review of appeals, their decision to file, to allow that lien to be filed or not. Well, I know that the CAP is so powerful that if, if I send a letter to an RO saying this is a, this is a request for uh, withholding the filing of a lien, and if you cannot make, give me this relief, this is a, a – request for a manager's hearing in anticipation of a cap. And if they file that lien and I don't get my cap, they take it away immediately. No questions. They take what away? The lien. If they make a mistake and file a lien when a cap request is pending. Huh. So you're better off having them make the mistake because you get rid of the lien without having a discussion. Well, you still have to go to appeals, and the appeals makes a determination as to whether the lien stays off. But sometimes they're tired of you by then, and they forget. And one thing all of you folks that are participants, you need to understand about a cap. We haven't gotten to it. That It is lightning fast. Once you make that request, you've got to have a conference with the group manager within, what, 24, 48 hours, Fran? It's fast. No, no you ask for a manager's meeting, and then as soon as she calls you, then you have – 
when as soon as they say no, you have 48 hours to fax the cap request to her, and then appeals has five days to schedule the hearing. And but see, appeals doesn't have an internal guideline as to how much time they can take to consider it, do they? Nope. Nope. Okay. But it, it's it's much quicker it's than any quick. other process. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Kristen, it's back to you. Okay, CDP hearings. Um, all right. I think what I'll jump to now is just talking a little bit what the hearing allows for the opportunity for the taxpayer to do, and it really is to raise all issues relating to the collection of that tax liability. You want to look at the appropriateness of collection actions. Always check the validity of the assessment, the collect the uh, the C said for the collection period to make sure that hasn't expired. You want to be sure you look at collection alternatives, installment agreements, partial pays, offers, CNC status. You want to look also at spousal defenses, any spousal defenses under 6015. And you want to challenge the existence or the amount of the underlying tax liability, but you're only going to be able to do that if the taxpayer did not receive a notice of deficiency or otherwise have an opportunity to dispute the tax. You want to raise pretty much any relevant issues you can relating to this unpaid tax, the lien or the proposed level, levy, and always look at the possibility of requesting a penalty abatement. Um, I guess prior to the, the CDP hearing itself, one thing to consider is maybe having your client start making good faith payments if they're looking to start an installment agreement and have that be approved. You can request collection alternatives at any time. We talked a lot about the delaying the notice of federal tax lien and the caps that can be done. Um, make sure you, you know your client. Get all the information you can on your client. Get the transcripts. Verify the assessments. Do a FOIA request if there's time. You can ask the appeals officer to look at the file look at doing accurate searches, credit reports, Google searches, just so you're prepared when you when you go in. The IRS is going to be required to pro provide notice to the taxpayer, and the notice requirements, you want to make sure those have been satisfied, that the, it was sent to the last known address, that there was certified mail return receipt, that it's not sent more than five business days after the filing of the lien notice, and it's sent at least 30 days before the proposed levy. On the notices, they, the service will actually calculate the date you must request for the CDP hearing, but I would advise to, to do your own calculations because if that date is wrong on the notice, then your taxpayer is going to be out of luck for the CDP hearing request. And the thing to remember with that is that it, the timing is going to be key. You want to make sure that it's 30 days from the date of the, the intent to levy and the notice of the tax lien. If you miss the 30 days, the taxpayer can request an equivalent hearing if it's requested within a year of the notice. But like the CAP, there's no judicial review, so the taxpayer can't appeal any of the determinations to the tax court. As far as best practices, some of the things we do when we look to complete the 12153 and do the actual request for the CDP hearing or the equivalent hearing, you know, oftentimes we the taxpayer comes in on the 29th day. So this is all the ideal or, or best practices, but oftentimes you don't have the opportunity to do everything. So sometimes you, you want to look to checking both the lien and the levy boxes and also request the equivalent hearing just in case you're, you're not within the 30 days. Um, make sure you, when you send the 12153, include a 2848 and a cover letter. Send it in a way that you'll have proof of mailing. And in our cover letters, we typically we ask for a face-to-face -face conference to be held at the local appeals office. We will ask for an, a penalty abatement if that's applicable. We will give a statement of all pertinent and potential issues. We'll reserve the right to amend and or supplement the request. We'll also ask that no ex parte communication occur between the IRS employees working on the case. 
And if we have enough information at the time, propose the collection alternative and submit the 433 if we have the time to prepare it. Now, the, I, the service will oftentimes request the taxpayer withdraw their CDP request. Now, the problem is if you do this, then you're going to waive any future appeals for, for on, on any decisions that the um, appeals officer makes. And with regard to the face-to-face -face hearing, your taxpayer is going to you're going to need to make sure the taxpayer has filed all the returns and they're paying any estimated taxes. Otherwise, the IRS will be able to deny the face-to-face um, -face CDP request. Um, let's see. And I think the the other the other thing to look at is you have the taxpayer would have the opportunity to record the hearings. The it's under uh, IRC 7521, but this request must be in writing and it must be prior, 10 days prior to the hearing. So, and you'll need a face-to-face uh, -face hearing in order to be able to, to have that record created. We have a couple more CAP questions. Uh, somebody wants to know how to handle a CAP request when an ACS when no RO is assigned. Uh, my answer to that is very painfully. Um, you're I've never have done that. Have you? Yeah. 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 Really? Um, Who do you send it to? And it no. actually, you don't. You have to. Well, you get. You have to get the fax number of the manager. You have to get a manager to call you back, and you have to get a fax number of the manager, and then fax it to ACS. I mean, here's what here's what I've done. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand, Bob. Uh, <laughs> what what we've done is we ask for the manager call back. Uh, when when we don't get it, we simply uh, fax a request for a CAP hearing uh, to ACS at whatever number or address we happen to have around at the moment. And then if things blow up, then we're waving it around either at the Taxpayer Advocates Office or uh, in our belatedly granted you know, CAP appeal. But I think it's important uh, if you're dealing with ACS, to get something in writing out there that you know that you can sort of wave around because of all the problems there are uh, getting manager callbacks from ACS and just dealing with those guys at all. Okay, the next question is: in uh, one of the speakers suggested writing to the RO and requesting a manager's hearing, putting letters language in the letter requesting a cap, and that if you sent that letter, the lien's going to go away. Well, you know, clients hear what you want, what they want to hear, but what was said is that the letter says, I would like you not to file a lien. If you can't abide by that, then consider this a request for a cap, and I would like to have a hearing with your manager in anticipation of the cap. The next step is, if they disregard that and then file a lien with out letting you have your cap, then they have to take the lien away and let you have your cap. There's no copy of that letter in the materials. Um, I guess if somebody wants to email me afterwards, I'll be happy to send a sample of what I use. One other comment on that is, is that they have to remove the lien. There's no statutory requirement because a cap is purely an internal process, isn't it? There's no statutory basis for it. They do it. And it's a matter of their discretion. Is that not accurate? I'm not aware of any statute that creates the cap and makes them remove stuff when they don't have it. I know you're not going to like it when I say this. It's in the manual. Cool. <laughs> that means it's not a statute. <laughs> and well, let me, let me just add. Let, let me just add on the CDP. Going back to that, uh, one other practical tip, and that is. The most important thing about a CDP hearing is that you request it. Um, I see so many clients who walk into my office and the the 30 days for filing the CDP request has, has been blown, and it's been blown uh, not just by the taxpayer, but by somebody, uh, you know, a tax representative who should have known better. Um, in, in my opinion, there's virtually no instance 
when you should not be requesting a CDP hearing, at least with request to a notice of intent to levy. And I will tell you where those instances are because I believe fully that you shouldn't file a CDP unless you know when the statute of limitations on collections going to expire and you've examined that real carefully and you take a look at your bankruptcy filing because the CDP hearing request extends a bunch of time periods. It's a tolling device. No, and, and you're absolutely right, Bob. So I would say it, you, ha you need to file that request unless you have a specific understanding or reason as to why you're not. Well stated. And you need to look for those. Uh, granted. Okay. Kristen, Sarah? Uh, Sarah, if you want to go ahead and, and take over, that, that was about my, all, okay. all my comments for the time. Okay, so this is Sarah Neal. Hi, everyone. Um, at the conclusion of the CDP hearing that we've been speaking of, the settlement officer or appeals officer who you were working with in the appeals division is required to make a written determination, known as a notice of determination. The <clears throat> notice of determination is supposed to outline all the issues raised at the hearing, the appeals decisions on each of the issues, and any other information. Um, it's generally supposed to be a fairly detailed document. It isn't always. The notice is required by law to inform the taxpayer that they've got 30 days to petition um, the tax court, and the tax court has exclusive judicial review over CDP appeals. So depending on your appeals officer, you may be able to assist him or her in defining the issues in the notice of deficiency and even writing it or part of it. Freudian slip, Sarah. You, mm -hmm. said notice of, you said notice of deficiency. I meant determination. <laughs> I know. I just want to throw that out there and make sure people don't think they're the same. No, they're definitely not. I apologize about that. But, okay. Um, and even writing it. But, but whether you actually want to do that, in my view, depends on whether you've reached an agreement or not. And and the reason I say that is this. If you've reached an agreement and you want everything to be, you know, clear as to what the expectations are, then yeah, if your appeals officer is willing to work with you, I think, you know, make sure that the record is clear as to what what you've agreed on. On the other hand, if you haven't been able to reach a resolution and you think that there's any possibility that your client is going to want you to petition the tax court, then I think you're better off not assisting in dra <coughs> drafting the notice of determination, if only because that if issues are left off or aren't described sufficiently, potentially that could provide support for or a basis for an argument and perhaps a ruling that the appeals officer abused his or her discretion. Um, and so I don't know that that's an easy answer as to whether to, to work with the settlement officer. I think it really just depends. Um, but I guess in cases that I actually might litigate, I would just let them do whatever they're going to do and, and start preparing for trial. Um, Sarah, let me yeah, ask one question yeah. on, on uh -huh. what you're doing with the notice of determination. Mm -hmm. Did that assume that you actually have filed the request for the CDP hearing and defined the issues in the request so you're comfortable with what you've submitted and you can litigate the, the issues that the appeals officer doesn't address in the notice of determination? You can. Let, so the tax court has held that even if issues aren't addressed in the hearing um, or in the you know prior paperwork submitted by the IRS, that that does not necessarily preclude the tax court from considering those issues. Mm. Now, I suppose it could be an issue. There's a case. It was decided, and it's a full tax court opinion decided in 2005. It's the Murphy case, which you may be familiar with. Mm. There's really great language on that point. Uh, where essentially the court's like, you know, there could be some defect in the record at the hearing, and it may not be apparent until after the hearing is concluded and the taxpayer receives the notice. The circumstances may justify allowing the taxpayer to raise the issue at trial, introduce evidence notwithstanding the taxpayer's failure to raise the issue at the hearing. Um, so while the form, you know, the publication that ex instructs the taxpayer as to what they need to do in filing a CDP request says taxpayer needs to raise all issues or they may be precluded from doing so later. 
Um, the tax court has, has suggested otherwise, and certainly we're going to talk about in a minute the scope of review, will certainly in, in many circumstances consider evidence um, that wasn't raised at the hearing. Now, um, I wouldn't necessarily rely on that because there have been some uh, federal courts of appeals that have disagreed with the tax court's approach. So we'll get to that in, in just a minute. Let me just say on best yeah. practices, I uh -huh. think – that if you get a taxpayer who's filed a request for a CDP hearing, it, it is a best practice for you as the lawyer to go back through and make sure that you have quantified and defined every issue that you can that you believe should be addressed so that when you do have the notice of determination issued, you can show that record to the tax court. Without that, you, you then get into a murky water where if I'm a tax court judge, I could go either way, saying if you didn't raise it, they didn't issue a notice of determination, I don't think I get to look at it again. I could go both ways. I I agree with you completely, which is why I like the idea of having a second person at my CDP hearing, not necessarily another lawyer from my office, but someone that, that doesn't know anything about the case that I could later call to testify if necessary as to what was said. Um, I like the idea of recording a CDP hearing, particularly in a big case where there's a lot of money um, that's owed to the service. Um, I think submitting documents, whether it's an offer and compromise and supporting documentation, installment agreement, penalty abatement, whatever the documents are, I think submitting them in some sort of bound you know, binder or with a cover letter, transmittal letter saying exactly what you're turning over um, is, are all good practices for the reason that you said. I mean, you want the record to be as clear as possible, and those are all things that would help you um, help you accomplish that. Another thing, by the way, that we've done to um, clarify the record is even after the um, the meeting with the appeals officer, we will uh, send a letter uh, laying out the you know the issues that you know, that were discussed and what was said, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, That's a yeah. great point. That's a yeah. great point, Dennis. And also, you know, for those of you in the audience that haven't done a lot of collection work or handled CDP hearings before, um, it isn't necessarily always one hearing, even if it's face-to-face. -face. I mean, many times you'll, you may sit down with the IRS or have a, a phone call but then there could be five subsequent phone calls and another meeting after the fact. I mean, these cases aren't always resolved, you know, quickly. And, and because of that, it just becomes even more important so that the record doesn't get confused and it's clear as to what's been turned over and the positions taken by the IRS and the taxpayer that you do exactly what Dennis is suggesting and send a follow-up correspondence. We had one question that came uh, still back on the other stuff. It's when a tax, if a taxpayer breaches an installment agreement, and then the IRS issues a notice of lien or notice of intent to levy, does the taxpayer get a CDP? On the notice of lien, they should by statute get one. On the notice of intent to levy, uh, yeah, they should get another CDP. But all of that assumes that they've never had an opportunity for a CDP hearing before the installment agreement. Sometimes that's not so likely. So if you breach the installment agreement and, and you, they've already issued the notice, then they can go ahead and levy without another CDP. So. But if you right. didn't, if if you didn't ever get a CP or, or an L1058, if you got an installment agreement before any of these notices came out, right, then they have to issue them, and you do get a CDP. That's but, absolutely right. But to make the, the terminology specific, a notice of intent to levy will not give you a right to a hearing. A final notice of intent to levy with right to notice of final hearing gets you a hearing because they can issue those notices of intent to levy 7,000 times. Right. But if you've you're, already you're had right. a CDP, you're not going to get another one. And, and just Sorry. to throw something out uh, also, which is that – in there will be many times when the reason that the installment agreement has defaulted is because the taxpayer has incurred a new liability. Right. So you can have a situation where a CDP notice was issued for one year, taxpayer screws up again, 
uh, it's true that the IRS can levy on the year that there was already a CDP notice issued, but now if we've got a new and additional year, if the IRS is to levy with regard to the new year, they have to issue a new CDP notice for, for that year. And if you uh, request a hearing from the new CDP notice, as a matter of practice, the IRS will generally stop collecting on the other years, even though uh, it doesn't legally have to. Well stated. Okay, so back to tax court review of the notice of determination. Um, so I don't remember this because I was still in college, I think, when the Revenue Reform Act came about. But if you can believe it, <laughs> I know. That's the sound of the old guys I, laughing. I actually <laughs> want war. I think war stories, we have time as to what the IRS collection process was like prior to 98 would be um, would be appropriate. But in any event, there was no judicial review, if you all can believe it, of IRS collection actions. So, again, I have no idea what that, what that was like in practice, but I can imagine a nightmare, particularly because now the fact that there is judicial review over these things gives us leverage. And in the tax collection world, we don't have a lot of it. So, um, so the tax court can review these things, and essentially in doing so performs four functions. It reviews the appeals officer's determination. It rules on alleged procedural defects in the hearing. It determines the underlying liability only in, in very limited circumstances. And I think Kristen touched on that earlier, but, but there are circumstances including like a trust fund determination where the taxpayer hasn't had a chance to appeal and a few other ones. Um, one thing I will mention while I'm on that is there was actually a case. I don't know if anyone saw it. It came down last month. I can't remember the name. I think it was on Yango, the commissioner, if anybody saw that. It was a full tax court case where the court held the taxpayer cannot decline to retrieve his postal service mail when he was reasonably able and had multiple opportunities to do so and then later successfully contend he didn't receive the notice of deficiency and therefore, in a CDP context, um, ask the court to determine his tax liability. So just an FYI, if you hadn't seen that case. Um, and, uh, generally, just ignoring your mail is not going to serve you well in tax litigation, period. Um, one other thing the tax court can do in context of a CDP case is determine whether the taxpayer is entitled to innocent spouse relief. That's one of the boxes that the taxpayer can check on the Form 12153. Um, the standard of review in a tax court case is generally, in almost all circumstances, abuse of discretion. And up until a fairly recent First Circuit opinion that hadn't been defined in the context of a CDP appeal, but it has now, at least by the First Circuit, and for people that represent taxpayers, it's not particularly positive um, <laughs> positive result. So that case, without getting into a lot of detail in the interest of time, it had to do with an offer and compromise. And there was some issue about whether the taxpayer actually owns some property. And depending on the state law and various other you know, substantive issues, it would be necessary to actually consider and understand the state law to determine whether these people actually own the property. So the appeals officer apparently did the best that he or she could and made a determination. The court, the, the First Circuit, in considering the standard of review, said that, that Congress, in drafting CDP, knew about the incomplete nature of the record that would be available to the IRS during the CD process, and that's why it would make little sense for a court to undertake de novo review. Rather, the CDP hearing should be, or the, what Congress envisioned is for the reviewing court to consider whether, whether the factual and legal conclusions reached at a CDP hearing are reasonable not whether they're correct. Um, and secondly, if they're reasonable, in that case, the uh, IRS's rejection of the offer and compromise was an abuse of discretion. So now apparently the First Circuit is using this reasonableness standard um, as opposed to whether the decision was technically correct as a matter of law or otherwise. Um, 
I looked again to see whether there's been any other cases interpreting Dalton, um, sort of latching on to Dalton. I couldn't find anything, but I will mention, I know Dennis is going to be talking about AJAC, but it appears that the IRS has certainly um, adopted the Dalton standard of review position. So I'm sure he'll get to that here in, in a moment. Um, just yeah, to I mean, mention, it, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, we, were you done with Dalton? Because I just wanted to say one thing. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, the the thing about Dalton, which sort of changes what went before, was, I mean, we always knew that in collection cases, uh, in CDP collection cases, as, as opposed to when the uh, when the amount of the liability was at issue, we, we always knew that the tax court was going to review for abuse of discretion. But if if I remember the the details of Dalton correctly, uh, the problem in Dalton was that the appeals officer got the law wrong, and what the tax court said in Dalton was, well. Uh, when if you get the governing law wrong, if the appeals officer is applying the wrong legal standard, by definition almost, that's an abuse of discretion. And what the First Circuit said was, no, no, uh, if, even if the appeals officer is wrong about the standard that he's applying, if it was, you know, reasonable uh, what he did, then there is no abuse of discretion, and therefore the tax court can't reverse or remand the decision of of the of appeals. Right. And I, I think that's you know an important point about about Dalton and why Dalton seems to go further uh, than what the tax court had said in the past. But but I don't. But as as I I know you know Sarah. Um, but there's there's no doubt that in collection cases the tax court reviews for abuse of discretion, and th and that's a tough uh, standard for the taxpayer to overcome. Yeah. Uh, let me by address the way, one thing on yeah. that, if I can, before we jump back, is, is that the tax court, for those of you that don't do this routinely, they have to abide by the law of the circuit in which the taxpayer resides. So for the first circuit, this is going to be applicable. The IRS may try it in other circuits. The tax court is not inclined, I think, to follow Dalton and other circuits, and they will apply the abuse of discretion on facts is an administrative law standard. But if it's wrong as a matter of law, the tax court, I think, will continue to take the position that they can decide matters of law de novo, that that's their right. If they get it right or wrong, that's their job to figure it out. They have a very limited scope of review. On facts, and, and they're not going to go beyond that outside the First Circuit, I don't believe. Yeah, well, let, let me and, just add something real quick. And part of this, I think, and I think there was some good language in the case about what does the IRS really have in front of it, the appeals division, in considering one of these. It may have some documentary evidence. It may have some affidavits from the taxpayer. It may have the taxpayer there. Um, but it probably and most likely didn't cross-examine anybody. It doesn't have the power to compel production of other documents. It doesn't have subpoena power of third parties. And so there are all sorts of, you know, problems with requiring, at least according to the Dalton Court, you know, I guess requiring the the appeals officer to, to get it right, which is how they came down with this reasonable standard. Well, having read every single friggin' CDP case for the last several years, <laughs> The tax court has really evolved. In the beginning, you know, and obviously there was a lot of abuses in, in taxpayers not knowing what they were doing, just filing these things on their own. And, and the government was getting a lot of summary judgments without the tax court hearing anything about it. And the tax court is becoming a lot more expert on collection issues. You know, they never heard collection issues before the CDP back in the caveman days before Sarah was practicing. And <laughs> so, you know, they they really have come to be experts at collection review. And just like in the tax court with substantive issues, sometimes you're going to have a client that, you know, 
gets people emotionally involved with their thing, and some of those judges bend over backwards to get to the right result, even though it may not fit in either abuse of discretion or de novo. Good point. And they may remand it back to appeals to let appeals have another chance to get it right or to look at things that maybe the court didn't think they should. And and so it is important for you to build your record and to personalize your taxpayer to get that appeals officer to feel their pain. Let me just mention before we move on to the next topic, because I know we're running running low on time, but let me mention just the scope of review issue because I think it is important if you have one of these to understand. Um, so the IRS in the regulations take the position that the tax court is supposed to only consider the administrative record and whatever has been developed. And that's everything from the taxpayer's request for hearing, written communications like Dennis and I were talking about before that you may want to send after a conference, you know, your financial statement, your 433 or 433AF, whatever you've submitted, any documents or materials relied on by the appeals officer. That's what the, you know, the the IRS continues to ask the court to limit their review to. The tax court in in some circumstances has determined that it will look beyond the administrative record. There's a case in 2004, it was a Robinette case, which if you do this work and you haven't re- you probably have read the case, but if not it's worth reading. It's an interesting decision. Um the full court weighed in. There's several concurring opinions, dissenting opinions, but ultimately the court in that case allowed evidence um of testimony and documents that were not presented during the hearing. Um, however, there are in, in several of the concurring opinions mentioned that, um, you know, some of the judges were like, we wouldn't necessarily agree to do this in every case, for example, in a situation where the taxpayer failed to cooperate with the appeals division. We might not then let the, the taxpayer come in and just present whatever he or she wants. Um, the tax court in that Robinette case was actually reversed by the Eighth Circuit. The Eighth Circuit determined that the tax court had not um, applied administrative law properly and that the court was, in fact, limited to the administrative record. Since that time, other circuits have agreed with the Eighth. Um, the tax court, though, in subsequent opinions, has, has declined to overrule Robinette um, and has continued to and, and doesn't always let other evidence in and has distinguished the facts of their cases from from these cases from Robinette, um, and has certainly declined to apply it per the Golson rule in, in certain jurisdictions that have held that only the administrative record is admissible. But the point is, is that this area of law is still developing, and you know, to the extent you have one of these cases, obviously make sure you know before you go into your hearing, you know, well before litigation, um, you know, what is the scope of review, and I think that will assist you in, in building your record and knowing the understanding the importance of of getting everything in um, during the appeals hearing. We have another question. Um, Someone wants to know if the CDP letter from appeals requests that you file anything, including an offer and compromise, 15 days before the hearing, and you take the offer and compromise with you, uh, will appeals look at it or will they refuse because it was, quote, late? That's a nice segue into Dennis's next topic on AJAC because I think they address that. But it is purely within the appeals officer's dis- discretion, and if they reject it because you haven't filed it until you actually got there on the date of the hearing, if they do reject it, you're not going to have much to review. Yeah, I suppose it's going to depend upon uh, whether a court eventually decides that it was an abuse of discretion to only allow 15 days to submit the documents. Right. And I guess that would just depend upon the specific, uh, you know, the specific facts. Well, I kind of think if this is like, you know, okay, you get your letter from appeals that says, hi, I'm your appeals officer, and then you get your letter saying, okay, I'm your appeals officer, and um, this is the date of our hearing, and if you want me to look at anything, send it to me 15 days in advance. Um, and you send your financials, but you don't send an offer and compromise. And you go to that hearing, 
if, if that was the end of the day, if there's a notice of determination and says I'm not going to look at an offer and compromise based on that, I think the court would kick it back. I don't. If, on the other hand, you delayed the hearing four times to get more information and this is not the first or you promise an offer and compromise and then don't do it, then I think that maybe you're in deeper water. But I don't – I. I don't. I, I think they're going to reduce – reject more and more of them because if you file the CDP request, you're going to say, I'm basing on offer and compromise, but I'm not going to bring it to you until the day of the hearing? Ooh. Well, but, but Bob, it's, it sort of depends. I mean, do you, you get the letter from appeals saying uh, there's going to be a CDP hearing in, in 20 days, uh, and I want it submitted 15 days before the hearing, so that's five days from the day this letter went out. Uh, you know, I, th I think that's why it's important to look at, uh, you know, whether it's reasonable within so the you, amount of time. You pick up the phone. I, I and also, call the I also think it's say that it, exactly. I, I think together. Yeah. Well, I think you have to have a dialogue with the the appeals officer and right. and try to come to an understanding. Don't just show up at the day of the hearing with the 433 or the um, offer in hand. Yeah. Okay, Bob, do you want me to get started on AJAC? I think I do. Thank you, Dennis. All right. So I'm going to try and grab control of these slides, uh, show off my tech technical prowess here, and see if we can get us to the... the, the One thing at a time, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There you go. See? There's, there's the right slide. Okay. So for a very long time, uh, Appeals has had the mission to settle cases, uh, on a fair and impartial basis, and it's used a hazards litigation model to do that, meaning that they're supposed to look at the facts, the law, uh, and figure out how a court might rule if it, if it actually went to court, and then say, well, you know, there's a 60-40 chance that, uh, that we would lose, and therefore we're going to offer a 60% a, you know, settlement. That's hazards litigation. And after the 1998 Senate hearings and the Taxpayer Bill of Rights uh, and with CDP hearings, and I'm one of those people who remembers life before CDP, um, the appeals officers or appeals had a new expanded workload. In the past, uh, they didn't have CDP cases, and Frankly, it seems like their involvement in collection stuff was, was relatively minimal. Um, and at first, regular appeals officers worked the collection cases. And what happened was they got bogged down. They, there were too many cases. The cases they had, they had a tendency to give away the store. They didn't have the right training because they were trained in, in uh substantive tax law, not in collection procedures. And so pretty quickly the IRS invented uh, something called a settlement officer. And at first I thought that under the statute only appeals officers could work uh, CDP cases. But if you read it, what you find out is the statute just says uh, that there's a right to appeal to the appeals division. So they, the IRS created these settlement officers who worked in the appeals division, but they had a lower pay level than appeals officers. And while appeals officers were former revenue agents, settlement officers are generally former revenue officers. And revenue agents, generally speaking, grew up. They got the idea that when they went to appeals, that this was a different function. It was not a continuation of the audit. And they were there to try and, uh, you know, settle cases. They understood that that was their mission. Unfortunately, while the revenue agents grew up, the revenue officers didn't. And instead, what happened was the settlement officers turned into a, a, what I would call a super revenue officer. I mean, they were already good revenue officers. That's why they got promoted to settlement officers. And when they got to appeals and these cases would cross their desk, they couldn't stand the fact that some revenue officer before them had screwed up, not answered the right questions, uh, not asked the right questions, and, and just hadn't handled it uh, properly. 
And so settlement officers were starting to, not starting to, were essentially reworking the cases. And although appeals has characterized the uh, AJAC uh, push or uh, program as a return to appeals traditional role, in my view, a lot of it is a pushback on compliance. Uh, appeals is short-staffed, and they don't want to be doing uh, they don't want to have compliance dumping their workload on appeals. Instead, they're going to send it back to compliance uh, when compliance hasn't done its job. And eventually, I suspect, the hope is, is that compliance will get it right the first time and start doing its, its job. And by the way, in, co in this context, compliance means exam and collection. And there's a completely separate set of provisions uh, AJAC provisions for exam, which obviously we're not even going to talk about today given the topic of our program, uh, but you need to look at those as well if you're doing um, uh, exam uh, work. All right. So the IRS came up with this Appeals Judicial Approach and Culture, ac acronym AJAC. And the project started a few years ago. They came out in December 2012 with some manual changes related to the trust fund recovery penalty. And then in July of last year, the IRS issued a lengthy memo with some interim guidance. And then at the end of last year, the interim guidance was rescinded and incorporated into various parts of the appeals manual. About a few weeks ago, the IRS came out with another document uh, in which they're implementing AJAC Phase 2. And they've said that AJAC Phase 2 will be effective on August 11, 2014. And those changes aren't yet in the Internal Revenue Manual, uh, but, but they, are, uh, they are supposed to be abided by. And I've, I've gone through the memo a couple of times. I would say that most of the changes in the, um, in the new policy statement for AJAC Phase 2 are mostly just filling out some details, and details in, in just excruciating uh, length. There, there are all sorts of little tables and when appeals is supposed to do A uh, and when it's supposed to do B. But in general, I don't think there are a lot of substantive changes in this uh, phase, phase two of, of AJAC. So these are supposed to be changes that improve efficiency and perceptions of appeals independence. Uh, they, AJAC points out that appeals hearing officers are not investigators or examiners, and again, they want to return to a quasi-judicial approach. So in order to accomplish this result, um, appeals has been instructed that it will not raise any new issues. And a new issue is uh, any issue that was not raised during collections consideration of the case. Now, to be perfectly clear, taxpayers can raise new issues, but it's appeals that cannot raise new issues. And this is a very significant change from the previous policy under which appeals could raise a new issue if, quote, the grounds were substantial and the potential impact on the tax liability was material. And frankly, nobody knew what this standard meant. Nobody understand what it meant that, you know, if the grounds were substantial or the impact on the tax liability was material, what was material, what was substantial. Nobody knew what it meant anyway. And uh, while on the exam side, uh, appeals generally did not raise new issues on the collection side. It seemed to happen all of the time. Uh, I'm going to skip some of these slides. We talked about uh, CAP at, at length. Uh, one comment, though, on, on CAP, and that is, is that in, under AJAC, 
appeals does not consider collection alternatives if you file a cap. So, for example, if the taxpayer requests a levy release because there's an economic hardship, but there's an unfiled return and the revenue officer says, no, I'm not going to release the levy until you file the tax return. If appeals determines that the levy should be released because there's economic hardship without regard to whether or not the return is filed, and this is uh, at least apparently what the tax court has said, uh, appeals will release the levy, or to be more specific, it will order collection to release the levy, but it will not consider a further case resolution uh, like an in uh, installment agreement or CNC status. Instead, it will send the case back to collection and it will be up to collection whether or not uh, it's going to pursue an installment agreement or some other resolution. Well, that really kind of takes the teeth out of, out of a cap, doesn't it? Yes. Well, yes and, yes and no. I mean, if you get what you want, which is getting the levy released, who cares if the revenue officer later on, um, you know, agrees to an installment agreement? I'm just as happy to have my levy released if I, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, if if the IRS doesn't want to take my installment agreement, well, so be it. Yeah, but you don't have a resolution. Fran, well, that's most of my clients don't want a resolution. What they want <laughs> is not to pay any money. Huh. That was the reason I asked earlier, when you said an appeals officer has a discretion on a cap, I really thought the manual required them to be very rigid in finding out those things that had to be done in order for a levy to be issued or uh, a lien filed. And if, there, if all of those things had occurred, I did not understand that appeals had the ability to exercise their discretion and say, oh, no. You should take an installment agreement or offer and compromise to make this go away. But I, I just said on the lien issue. I didn't say on the rest of the stuff. Okay. Well, I I think that you can still ask for a cap appeal on the grounds that your installment agreement is, is, is rejected. And yeah. I think that if if you have, you know, a good factual argument, um, my understanding is is that appeals has quote you know discretion to to look at it. It would have to have because if you offer an installment agreement, that stops the statute, and they have to give you an appeal. You've got a separate appeal on the rejection of an installment agreement that's not a cap. If you're doing a cap, well, that's right. An installment agreement, then you're going across purposes, and they're going to kick one of the two out. Well, all the all the procedures are in the IRM, and it's um, 8.24.1 on the Collection Appeals Program. And it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that after AJAC has re revised everything or before? Yeah, it's, it's still there. It's 8.24. Okay. In yeah, and, it, and the, um, the date on it is March 25, 2014. And it has it has a nice little laundry list, and I actually popped it up. Uh, I have a slide here which I skimmed over. It's the uh, it, it's it's the previous slide where they have a nice little laundry list of all the things you can do under under CAP. Again, remembering as has been pointed out, CAP is the IRS's program. No statutory rights at all. The rejected installment is agree agreement is under a CAP. There you go. Uh, all right, so I'm going to skip the collection due process slides. I think we've talked enough about that. We've talked enough about Dalton. And I want to now skip over to uh, offers and compromise under AJAC because I think that this is a very important uh, change here. And don't mind me. I'm just fumbling for some notes here, guys. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. So I think these these two points are just huge. Um, 
Appeals is not supposed to get new financial statements. They're not supposed to be requesting an updated financial statement if the information is less than 12 months old as of the date that the, that the case uh, and what we're talking about, by the way, here is an appeal of an offer and compromise in a non-CDP context. And so if that comes into appeals, uh, they are not supposed to be requesting new financial statements. Let me give you a very quick example. Let's assume you submit a financial statement uh, to an offer specialist January of 2013. You go back and forth with the offer specialist. Eventually, you can't come to an agreement. Um, you file, uh, they, they come out with a determination. You appeal that determination. It makes its way to appeals. Uh, and this entire process takes until November of 2013, until it arrives in, in appeals inventory. It takes another two months before you get a letter from the appeals officer uh, or the appeals division saying they have the case. And eventually, somewhere around April of 2014, the appeals officer calls you up and says, hey, uh, let's talk about this, this offer. And in the past, what the appeals officer would say, and please get me new financials. This one is old. And what this, what Ajax says is, is no, uh, this is not acceptable. If the information was less than 12 months old, and remember it was 12, it was 11 months old in November of 2013 when the case itself arrived in, in the appeals division. Now it's older than 12 months. That doesn't matter. That's not the measurement. Appeals is not supposed to be asking me for a new financial statement. And if, uh, even if it was older than 12 months when it got to appeals, if the information has become outdated as a result of IRS delay, once again, appeals is not supposed to be asking for new financial information. Uh, if they need it, if, if, uh, if it's beyond this period and some information is necessary, you don't need to do a new 433A. Uh, pen and ink changes are, are sufficient. Another important change here, the appeals is not to, supposed to be searching for new assets. Only assets documented by collection will be considered. Uh, another important change here is appeals will not value an asset in excess of the value determined by collection. So, for example, let's assume there's a, a house and there's $100,000 of equity. And now, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's assume eighteen months have passed, and in theory, I guess appeals is, is supposed to be able to request a new financial statement. And let's assume the value of the house is, has gone up ten percent, and now there's one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars worth of equity in the house. Generally speaking, uh, appeals is not supposed to consider an asset value in excess of the value determined by collection. Um, appeals is not supposed to return cases as a, as a pre premature referral uh, if collection did not fully develop certain issues. So uh, let's assume that, and, and this would happen all the time in the past, we are in agreement with, with the offer specialist on the value of all of the assets but there's some dispute about, oh, you know, the client was claiming too much in, in medical expenses. And you'd go to appeals, and, and appeals would say, yeah, you're right about the medical expenses, but, gee, I, I think that the offer specialist gave you um, or, or failed to consider that there were dissipated assets here. Appeals is not supposed to be doing that. They're only supposed to review the appeal for the specific issues that are in dispute. Uh, the taxpayer, on the other hand, may present new issues during appeal. And if the new information is complex, then appeals may uh, go back to collection and ask them to do some more investigation. But if it's just some items such as uh, some new household bills, some new account statements, pay stubs, uh, 
that can be reviewed by appeals without requesting collection intervention. So um, we're, we're running out of time. I would suggest that you take a look at the at the um, at the rest of these slides. They're they're in the handouts, and I've got some very specific references to the Internal Revenue Manual that you can look at. But I need to get back to Bob so he can talk about bankruptcy. Okay, we have two questions. Um, somebody wants to know um, how come appeals uses different standards calculating future income. Some use 12 months. Uh, some use remaining coal sed. Uh, any thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is extremely confusing. There is a threshold for offers and compromise, and that is is that if the taxpayer can pay the liability in full during the remaining life of the collection statute, you don't get to the point where you start doing these 12-month calculations. So even though there's, there's a, quote, fresh start and new standards, what they didn't change was that uh, if you can pay it, if your client can pay it within the remaining life of the statute, then you don't even get to the offer process. And what this has done, and I've been railing about this for years, um, is that it creates this per perverse incentive to have the taxpayer build up his liabilities higher Instead of paying his current taxes, uh, the incentive is for the taxpayer not to pay the current taxes because maybe that will get him over the threshold. He'll no longer be able to pay during the remaining life of the collection statute, and then he can use this 12-month uh, multiplier. Okay, and the next question is, if you have a new case with a possible coal set issue and we're provided an incomplete record by the client, what's the best way to perform an analysis and determine – any tolling and, uh, and proceed? Well, I think the short answer is you get the transcript, and that has all the important information on it. The more direct answer to that is the Internal Revenue Service will not give you the C set. They don't have a module sitting around anywhere where they keep track of it. Uh, if, if, if you've got statutes that are getting ready to toll, you can go ask them. I generally don't want to do that because I just assume they not start thinking about it, particularly if they've got more than 12 months left and might want to look at reducing it to judgment. If you can, I'm going to eat into your Q&A time. Most of you folks that want to submit questions have done a pretty good t job of doing that. Uh, I'm going to go back to the bankruptcy part, and I want to start telling you something about why I do bankruptcy. And When it came out and they decided in offers of compromises that you had to do something, that would give you 20% up front, and they hadn't implied the 12 and the 24 month rules for uh, discretionary income, then I said baloney, because there's a whole bunch of time that got lost in processing offers and compromises, and I didn't think they were worthwhile. So I started looking at and got a whole better idea of what you could do in the bankruptcy world. And as soon as I can get to the starting point on the slides, I'll take a look at it. There we go. What you're really trying to do, and, and what Fran and I have done, and, and Dennis is not amenable to this quite yet, <laughs> is that if you, he talked about increasing the amount of income that you have, I mean debt, so that you can go in and you can use the 12 months. My position has always been, and it's a brief war story, where a physician came to me and he had invested in shelters that wiped out all of his taxable income for one year. Two years later, he had audits on each of the shelters, and they had deficiencies somewhere between a million and a million five. And I told him, we can litigate these in the tax court. You're not going to be happy with the result or with the legal bill. But if you agree to an assessment today, and his assets were leveraged, and we wait 240 days, I can file a bankruptcy, and your taxes will be discharged, and you get to keep all of the money on the other side. And he bought into that, and we filed it, and the United States Attorney's Office and the Tax Division Department of Justice objected as much as they could, but it worked, and it will work. So I don't take any of these processes with an installment agreement offering compromise uh, to be rid of a tax liability until I do a parallel comparison of getting rid of the liability in a bankruptcy proceeding. Now, 
I'm going to go through and talk to you a little bit about what those are because some of you may not be controversy lawyers, and most of you are certainly not bankruptcy lawyers, and the best thing I can do is get you an overview of how we deal with this. The bankruptcy tax myth. You have to have a bankruptcy purpose other than a tax claim. No, you do not. If you've got a huge tax liability, a tax liability for means testing is not a consumer debt, and that means the means testing where you have to give some of your income back is generally not going to apply. Bankruptcy judges do not like or understand tax con – no, bankruptcy judges don't care. The guys that do that deal with more complex commercial lending and than we can ever get to them to deal with in a tax matter. And between the Department of Justice, District Council, and you, we can educate them, and they educate well. They're bright people. Bankruptcy lawyers do not understand tax issues or tax litigation. That's not a myth. That's true. And, and getting you in there to talk with them is frightfully important. And, and you're not going to become a bankruptcy lawyer. You're going to have a very limited engagement trying to define exactly what it is that makes this particular tax go away or has some other attribute that you want to put in a bankruptcy. Tax lawyers do not understand bankruptcy tax transaction. That's not a myth either, and that's what I'm trying to work on. Uh, and a lot of folks that deal with collection work aren't licensed attorneys. They're not admitted to bankruptcy court, and the thought of trying to do that is difficult. And when they go talk to a bankruptcy lawyer that doesn't know it and find out that they don't either, it, it quickly evaporates. But it's got a whole lot of things that work. Your objectives are principally three, discharge, full absolution. You get rid of the debt. If you've got something that's less than three years old, you've got a problem, and we'll talk about that. The exceptions on the discharge, notice a federal tax lien. If it's been filed before the filing of the bankruptcy, it attaches to all the debtor's assets. You can discharge the tax, but the lien is still going to be there as to that property and any appreciation. ERISA qualified. This is a, a very hairy little area. Anything where you're dealing with an IRA, a pension plan, a 401K, and you're filing bankruptcy, you, you're thinking you want to make an exempt, and you probably don't if you've got a tax problem. But it's there, but, and you're noticed that it's a bad issue. And it's even for those of us that do it, it takes a lot of time. Okay, if you don't discharge, you can get a deferred payment. Chapter 11, you've got five years. An individual Chapter 11 for high rollers is a very good idea. Most of us don't do this for free. We don't do it for pro bono clinics. We do it for people that have money. And an 11, you're going to need a lot of money. But you get to pay back any of the priority debt over five years. And if you've got a non-priority debt, you can dribble down as to what you're going to pay them. The Chapter 13 is, gives you three years automatic. You get two more if you can show a hardship. A 13 is actually really good if you have a guy or gal who's got seven – I can do a Chapter 7 and discharge tax, but I can't get rid of all of it. The Chapter 13, you can immediately file. You won't get a discharge, but the court has the jurisdiction to allow those folks to pay off those things that you can't discharge over five years. And ladies and gentlemen, I've yet to meet the revenue officer or settlement officer who will give you five years on an installment agreement to pay off the liability. No, oh, you haven't met you haven't met any of our our revenue officers. That's true, but by statute they're supposed to go back and visit it every twelve months anyway. Uh, the third objective is tax litigation in the bankruptcy court. You can go in under bankruptcy code section five oh five and file a motion and ask the court to determine whether you're liable or not. You can't do that in the C B D P hearing if you've already gotten a notice of deficiency even if you defaulted. Uh, that's a big deal because a lot of these folks don't owe the money, and you have to go in. They may not owe the amount. They may not be substantive liable, and that's a wonderful tool, and the bankruptcy courts are very good to do that. I have the further litigation of a complaint to determine dischargeability. I'll, I'm going to defer that. That's a little nuanced, but it's kind of important for me that you understand that, and Fran can tell me why I'm wrong when we get to it. You're wrong. Thank you. Taxes that are dischargeable in bankruptcy. These are what I call the timing rules. The first thing is that the due date of a return as extended for a year, regardless of whether it's been filed or not, 
must be more than three years prior to the time that you file the bankruptcy petition. This example uses December 12th of 2013. And that's because we presented this in Vegas in 2013 on December 12th. 2010 and earlier, they're dischargeable if they meet all the other little rules. Let me jump over the 200 the two-year rule. The 240-day rule is if you have a brand new assessment, even if it's older than three years, you have to wait 240 days. Congress, in its wisdom, gave the Internal Revenue Service that amount of time to collect a new assessment. It's still there, but it's also told by filing offers and compromises. So those of you who work with folks, go to the tax court and say, we can file an offer and compromise as soon as this comes down. Pull in the brakes. Uh, I, I've had to tell people we don't file an offer and compromise. We just keep stringing out the process to get that 240 days to go away. And by the way, this is a great point to note. You do not file a request for a CDP hearing during that 240-day period because it's extended by the bankruptcy code. So be careful. And I've managed by requesting installment agreements and requesting collection equivalent hearings to extend the 240 days and we get the discharge. But those are the timing rules. Now, the two-year rule is late filed returns. If you file a return after its due date, as extended, you have to wait two years before filing bankruptcy to discharge the liability on that return. Your real big problem is if the government files a substitute for return in between. Fran might talk about that if I have any time left and these people don't cut me off. Uh, if she doesn't, it's okay because th th this is very nuanced and it, it gets to the point where people that really do this sometimes don't understand it. Bob, you have a question of the taxpayer. Um, not I, Fran, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do have to give the um, the participation verification code and then we can still go back because we still have a few minutes left. Go. Um, so, and also, uh, if anyone wants to call in and ask a question. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to register to ask a question, please press the star key followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press star one on your telephone keypad again. And if you are using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before entering your request. And while our callers get in line, we will now give you your ABA Participation Verification Code required to receive CLE credit for this program. You will be asked to enter the code in the online attendance form following this program. The ABA Participation Verification Code is 1, T as in Tango, 1, 4, D as in Delta, F as in Foxtrot, D as in Delta 5. That code again is 1, T as in Tango, 1, 4, D as in Delta, F as in Foxtrot, D as in Delta 5. And I don't have any callers in the queue at the moment, so you can um, carry on with that question, Fran. Okay, Bob, the question to you is if the taxpayer does not file his 1040, does the three-year rule to discharge the taxes in bankruptcy apply to the years for which the taxpayer failed to file his return, although the IRS has computed taxes for those years, in other words, 60-20 returns? Uh, the answer is the three-year rule does apply. It has to have that maturity date, but you also have to have the two-year rule, and if they've made an assessment in between, then you've got a bugaboo that you're going to have to work out, and the government will take the position that if they've made an assessment before you file the return, then to the extent of that assessment, you've never filed a return, never can file a return, and it will never be dischargeable. There's a ton of litigation going on about that. There's a lot of efforts to get clarification in the statute, and it's just a great big mess. Brian, can I take back control of this for a minute? Okay, there's another question going back to yes, CDP. Sorry. Okay. Can a CDP hearing be an effective form in which to request collection action against an individual for 6672 trust fund be ceased where the business has entered into an installment agreement for all outstanding employment taxes? On that deal, that, I think it can be. The question is effective form. Would a, an appeals officer issue a notice of determination saying, defer all your collection action while we're good people and go about this. 
I'm not certain on whether an appeals officer or a settlement officer would do that. I am absolutely God Almighty certain that a bankruptcy court will actually do that if you file for the individual that's being uh, harassed on the 6672. They will generally enter into an agreed order not to take any action against the individual for collection of the trust fund recovery while the debtor entity continues to make payments. But part of that deal is as soon as that entity falls out of favor or screws up, they're going to turn right around and go bang. But I, I don't like using CDPs for that. I prefer using an individual 11. The bankruptcy uh, discharge prohibited part, fraudulent return, oh, that's pretty easy. Uh, willfully attempt in any manner to evade or defeat. That is generally going to be a sin of commission, not omission. The service is litigated on just taking your money and spending it for something else as a, a bad thing. But if, if it demonstrates an affirmative intent, and there's some cases out there that are pretty good. Trust fund taxes are not dischargeable. Not assessed, but not assessable is not something you guys need to really worry about. Collection after bankruptcy, I can discharge the tax, but if the lien is still there and it attached beforehand, it's still going to get their money out of that. They have to do something about it. Uh, when does the debtor get a discharge? The Chapter 7, the court enters an order, three to six months. Chapter 13, only after the last plan payment is made unless you go in and move to show that there's hardship. Uh, Fran has done that in the past and shown that there's reasons that a court should consider it. Bankruptcy courts are pretty uh, objective in taking a look at things like that. Eleven, uh, same deal that you can put in your plan where you may want to go and get that discharged earlier. Uh, chapter 11 individual, the advantages, disadvantages. These are all pretty cut and dry. I've got certainty under advantages. I will tell you that filing a Chapter 7, if you've done your homework, you get the transcripts, you go through the dates and make sure what periods of time have been told, haven't been told, I can cut in half or by 90% the amount of time that it will take to get a discharge in bankruptcy compared to the amount of time and cost that you need to do an installment agreement or an offer and compromise. Now, when I say certainty, I... If your tax is dischargeable, it's dischargeable as a matter of law. You don't need to do anything else. I never file a bankruptcy on a tax matter unless I am certain. And then if I am certain, I file a complaint to determine dischargeability. Most people disagree with that. But I can get the complaint filed, and I can generally get an agreed order. Then I don't have to worry about litigating it in the future. If you have a case that's bad and you've got a taxpayer that's got linen that you don't want passed upon in front of a bankruptcy court, you can sit there and you can wait, and the government might come back and levy. And you will say to me, well, that's barred by the you know, automatic stay or the stay of the bankruptcy. Uh, and the answer is that's right, but the government has a different view, and it says it's not discharged. You then have to go back. You write the letter to the IRS and said, you're mistaken. Here's why it's discharged. And they say, no, you're wrong. You go back to the bankruptcy court and you file a motion to open the proceeding and a motion to show cause why the government should not be held in contempt. Now, that's just a little bit longer process, and my notion is if I'm going to file the bankruptcy, I ought to be sure. There's cases where you have to go and you have to file it and wait. Uh, chapter 13. It's got a lot of good stuff. I'm not sure there's anything in here that you need to know about. This is not just for poor folks or workers. So you have to have a stable system of income, but it is a, a tool that you can use for people who have everyday problems with taxes, and the government knows that this is there, and they work with you. If you abuse it, they're going to abuse you, and, and believe me, they got the horses. Individual tax, Chapter 11. This is a good deal. There's a real problem with this. After the bankruptcy act was amended to make post-petition assets part of the estate, you, you've got a problem with what they call absolute priority. Just remember that. Most governments and most bankruptcy courts, you're going to be able to run with this without the absolute priority. But if somebody starts talking about it out loud and means it, it's going to be a big problem. And, and nobody knows quite where that's going to go. We've seen cases that uphold that. Okay. We're not going to do the late filed returns that Fran has. What we've shown you today, we hope, 
is an installment agreement, partial pay installment agreements, offers and compromise are all subject to review by, within the Internal Revenue Service by the Appeals Division Settlement Officer. Dennis talked with you about what AJAC does and what they have to do in the consideration. Sarah and Kristen went through, I thought, a pretty good outline of how we're supposed to move through appeals, get a record set up, and then whether you go to tax court. And what I hopefully have given you some thought about is that the bankruptcy court constitutes a third-party source where you can go to get relief, and if you just watch this, you can educate the bankruptcy lawyers, but you're going to have to read the transcripts of account, understand the liability, and do their work for them so that they get helped out. With that, thank you guys for participating. Okay, can I have two things? We have a question. Does a fraudulent return exception to discharge include a Chapter 13 plan to repay? Yes. Okay. And I have one case, since you didn't let me talk the, last, the second time, and that is that um, the tax court has kind of turned the substitute for return on its head for certain purposes in Robertson v. Commissioner, TC Memo 2014-143, the court said, guess what, IRS, you don't get failure to pay penalty if it's a substitute for return because it isn't a return and you only get a penalty for failing to pay for tax on a return. Always been in the manual. So anyhow, well, they tried to litigate it. <laughs> I'm surprised. That's it. Has anybody else got any comments or questions? Uh, no, and, and that is actually all the time we do have, so thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, you can post any additional questions or comments on the web board for this program. On behalf of the American Bar Association, the ABA Business Law Section, Criminal Justice Section, Government and Public Sector Lawyers Division, Section of Taxation, and the ABA Center for Professional Development, thank you for participating in this program. To learn more about the sponsors, visit the ABA website at www.americanbar.org. Thank you, and please click on the evaluation link. We value your feedback.